calorie restriction does not work at all for several reasons. Number one, if you're too late to adjust to that, you will definitely start to gain weight start to become more and more unhealthy. I cannot believe how much weight they lost. And I say, how did you do it? And they say, I did exactly what you told me to do. We're gonna talk about metabolism, uh, weight loss, some hormone issues. But to start in your practice and people you work with, what are some of the issues people start to run into when their metabolism slows down, or starts working improperly due to modern lifestyle or, or other factors? So that's a great question. Um, I get a lot of patients coming in to see me who just feel very frustrated. They have been doing the same things they've been doing for years. They haven't made any significant changes to their diet, changes to their exercise routine, and they find that they are consistently gaining weight despite doing all of the stuff they had been doing for years. Um, and I actually tell them that's problem number one, that they are doing the same thing they have been doing for years. So the body's metabolism changes as we get older. That is the natural progression of life. So if you're 40 or 50 years old and feel like the things you were doing when you were 20 or 30 aren't working, that's because you have a very different body in your 40s and 50s than you do in your 20s and 30s. Your hormone production is different. Your cell's response to insulin is different. Your makeup of fat to muscle is very different. And so you need to embrace this new body and this new metabolism and adjust what you're doing to really optimize your health. Um, generally, that comes into looking at foods we're eating and exercises that we're doing. So a lot of times patients will come in and they feel like if they're not eating junk food, they're doing okay. And I think that comes from just living through our 20s and 30s, feeling like, okay, I can eat a little healthy. I can make some errors with junk food and I'll be fine. And then they think all I need to do is cut out junk food. But really, you need to look at the whole diet. I mean, you want to make sure that you're getting adequate nutrition from vegetables, um, complex carbohydrates, healthy proteins, healthy fats. It's not just about, okay, I'm going to cut out candy or cut out ice cream. It's really looking at everything that you're eating and making sure that you are optimizing your nutritional status. When it comes to exercise, one of the main problems, again, is that people have been doing the same exercises for years and are now getting frustrated that it's no longer working. So as the body gets older, cardiovascular exercise becomes a little bit less important for weight loss and muscle building exercise really becomes critical. Muscle helps the body process glucose and insulin. Muscle helps fuel the metabolism. Muscle helps fight insulin resistance. So that is what the exercise focus needs to be as people age. Okay. And you've hit on so many good areas and things that I've run into even in my you know early 30s so this stuff can happen earlier than we realize and i think what you started by saying that the body changes it's just so easy to be to get in a routine as human beings we follow the momentum that we're in really until a problem comes up so if things are going along good it's only natural to be like all right this is working and you get into these habits over the years and without knowing it your your body makes these internal changes as as you age or as you know, in my case, I realized that lifestyle ended up catching up to me, but, you, but you're so right. Like in your 20s, you, you get away with it and you're not getting these signals. If either your body can handle it or I feel like things are happening deeper in the body, but it's not really expressing in significant weight gain or significant symptoms right. until, until it catches up to you. And you're like, how do, how do we end up here? And it is, right. it is frustrating. Um, so is, so let, let's just start actually, can, how do you define metabolism. People hear that word all the time. And especially when you run into these frustrating health issues, the weight gain, the, the fatigue, the brain fog, just not feeling good. Um, people hear that. And a lot of times I feel those symptoms are just written off as, as aging, but I don't think they have to be. And, and hopefully we'll cover some of that today too. But just to, for starters, how can people think about what is, what is this metabolism that they hear about that might be causing all these headaches for them? Yeah. So um, it, kind of a simple way to think about metabolism is how your body is processing things, foods that you're eating, 
amount of exercise that you're doing, amount of sleep that you're getting, amount of stress that you have in your life. It's how your body is processing those things and what your body does with those things. For instance, if your metabolism is in great shape and it's or maybe you're on the younger side or you're doing other things to kind of optimize your metabolism, you might be able to eat large amounts of food and not gain any fat from it because your metabolism is really optimized. But if your metabolism has slowed down due to certain factors, that same amount of food that you're eating is not going to be processed in the same way. You're now going to be storing excessive amounts of it as fat. It could cause potentially your blood sugar to become too high, which can lead to things such as feeling very tired, especially after meals. So it's all about how your body is processing what you put into it and how you treat it. Okay. Okay. Amazing. So how can people think about this, especially these changes? It's just so fascinating, right? Because it's just hugely important. I mean, basically, it's everything the body's doing, which is, is life at some level. And suddenly that can change, or or let's even just say gradually, that can can start to make changes. How is there a way to be more aware of it? How could people um, respond and make make these changes? Your you know some stuff you're talking about, maybe tweak tweak the diet, the food, the exercise to be a little more aligned and a little more supportive of the metabolism changes that naturally happen. Right. So I would say. 40 years old really seems to be the age where that's the time you need to start thinking about health, thinking about what you're significantly going to change in your life. You know, in your 30s, that should be in the back of your mind. You should be starting to make sure you're doing exercise routines and make sure you're getting in vegetables and everything like that. But 40 is where we really start to see the metabolism take a major shift. And if you're too late to adjust to that, you will definitely start to gain weight, start to become more and more unhealthy. Studies have really shown, especially in women over the age of 40, if they don't change anything about their lifestyle, they will gain at least one pound per year doing the same things. So this isn't, okay, now I'm I'm starting to not eat that well. I'm starting to not exercise anymore. No, this is the people that maybe they were eating okay. And maybe they were exercising sometimes. If they don't, you know, kick it up a notch, they're still going to continue to gain weight as time goes on. That is so important because I just, again, I'll emphasize what I said earlier. It's just not the way we're wired as humans. We, if something we really, it really usually takes uh, pain or something going wrong to change, which is often what happens with metabolism. People are like, hey, you know, where's all this extra weight coming from? I, you know, all of a sudden I don't want it. Or like you mentioned, I'm falling asleep after meals, like this is no good. Um, but it sounds like, but, and then I just feel like that message isn't out there enough. Like actually you need to be proactive because doing the same thing, it's guaranteed to have negative consequences, even if you're doing the same things, what worked. And I find that a lot, like very few people that I talk to are purposely eating poorly. Almost everybody feels like, yeah, I, I really make an effort to eat well. Sure. I do some cheats here and there. But I, you know, it's it's important to them. Like most people want to eat a little healthy, yet still most people run into some of these these issues we're talking about, either as they age or their health status changes. And I think one of the the biggest problems I see when I'm discussing this kind of stuff with patients is that a lot of them feel as though they have been making these healthy changes. They started buying keto bread and they've been eating protein bars and protein shakes every day. They're trying to get in their certain amount of protein and they think they're doing all of the right things. Unfortunately, that's not exactly the way that it works. A lot of these health products are actually very, very detrimental to our health. Um, it's a very confusing world out there. You go to the supermarket, you see all of these great labels. Everyone is promoting healthy food because that is becoming a big issue right now. But I try to explain to my patients that you know each one of these products, they have a whole marketing team behind them. They are going to make that the front of that box as appealing as possible to someone who is looking to get healthier. And unfortunately, if you don't really do your research into what you're buying, you most likely are going to be eating products that are worse for your health than eating something you were having before. And I would say even if you do do your research nowadays, there's just such a vast variety of opinions of 
influencers of even even doctors like we, we've got doctors who swear veganism is the way to go and who swear carnivore is the way to go so mm -hmm. people even if you do do your research people eventually choose a lane and and what i find is a lot of times the further down the road they, they find the limitations of that I, i've been through that probably three or four different times where i'm like okay this is this is the way to optimal health and then you just find out eh, some of that might have been true and some of it not ideal so how um is there do you recommend people think about this in a certain way or how you know for someone who who is making that effort to eat healthier how do they protect themselves or just think about this in a, in a smarter way uh, in terms of what's marketed and, and all the different options they're going to have. Yeah. So I, I basically am a big believer in kind of ancestral eating, eating as close to the earth as possible. So the, the further the, your product gets from the earth, the more processed it is, the more it's changed in a factory, chemicals have been added, preservatives have been added. So I'm a big believer in eat from the earth, eat vegetables, eat fruit, eat eggs, eat meat, eat whole milk, eat things as natural as possible. Um, I oftentimes tell my patients if they can't recognize what what something is, you know, out of a box, meaning they can't think, where did this come from? What kind of vegetable did this come from? What kind of grain did this come from? If they really can't recognize a product, it's probably over-processed. You know, our bodies were not designed to to ingest artificial sweeteners. Our bodies were not designed to eat preservatives. Our bodies were designed to eat the foods provided on the earth in a sense. So when you add in all of these new chemicals that our bodies have not been exposed to until recently and these new preservatives, um, it really changes a lot about the body. It changes hormone production. It changes insulin levels. It, I find that these are the products that lead to more weight gain than sugar in a sense. So my big advice for my patients, it, you know, I don't want them to eat this extreme way, like all carnivore or all vegan or all anything. It's more just about eat products that come from the earth and not from a box. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. There's a period of time when I first started learning about this years ago, where I was learning how to get a little more well, learning some of the tricks that the food manufacturers do in the packaging and on the labels. But eventually where I got to is like, don't don't buy things with labels and i yeah. try to buy as many single ingredient foods as i can and it was it was great it was just simplified everything absolutely like, like to your point i don't idea. have to learn these six syllable chemical names to look out for i just just right. don't buy the uh buy as few foods with in ingredient labels as possible right okay and so from there is that for a lot of your for the majority of patients does that then work if they're going more whole foods more closer to the earth or do people need to go steps further, maybe thinking about, you know, balance of macros or, or, or I'm just using that as an example, but any, any uh, guideposts yeah. that also are helpful? So I, I would say that um, uh, it's, I'll lean a lot of my patients, if they go a little bit too far off the deep end with counting macros, counting calories, weighing food, um, you know, making sure they're they're logging everything into an app. In my opinion, that that just goes a little bit too far into almost an obsession over food and things like that. Um, if you you know a lot again, a lot of these products, I'm really against processed foods. If you haven't noticed, but a lot of these products have ingredients that are designed to stimulate appetite and to keep you eating that product. I mean, that's how they're selling it. Like you can, you know, finish a bag of chips, basically, if you had a bag of chips in front of you. I think that's true for most of us. But if you had, for instance, a, um, a group of bananas sitting on your counter, would you eat all, you know, five or six of those bananas in one sitting? No, because when natural food hits your body and all of the receptors in your digestive system, your body knows when to stop. All the receptors work. They say, okay, we're full. We don't need any more. But when you're eating these processed foods, your body does not know how to digest them. It doesn't set off those signals that you're full, that you don't need to eat anymore, that this was too much of a bad thing. And so, you know, you want to, you want to think about it as more of, um, a way of intuitive eating, you know, thinking, okay, I'm going to eat when I'm hungry and I'm going to eat until I'm full. But you need to make sure you're doing that with healthy foods 
and not foods made in a in a packet. Okay. So let's and if we go back to let's just this example, person whose metabolism is changing over the years, they're wanting to avoid some of these problems we mentioned at the beginning. Is that fo- will that focus get in there? Say they start to focus more on these whole foods and less of the hyper palatable processed foods. I mean, that's clearly going to make a benefit. Does does that get people further enough along so they're not dealing with unexpected weight gain or fatigue or or other common issues? Yeah, I have had so many patients come back to me, you know, three or six months later and even post menopause they've lost like 20 or 30 pounds which is very difficult post menopause cuz menopause really slows the metabolism and i i walk in the room i cannot believe how much weight they lost i'm assuming they've been on a weight loss medicine maybe with another doctor and i say how do you how did you do it how did you lose that weight and they say i did exactly what you told me to do and they cut out the processed foods they cut out the package they ate foods native to the earth and they naturally lost that weight. But it's not easy. It's very easy to buy something that is shelf stable, that is in a package that you can easily grab, especially on the go. It's not easy to eat foods that spoil. You know, we don't all have time to go to the grocery store or every single day or every other day to get natural foods that are, you know, intended to spoil. It's just, it's a difficult thing. But for the people who really put in the work, they see the results for sure. Amazing. That's a uh, very encouraging. What are some things that people do or think they're supposed to do? Let's go to the flip side of this that that aren't helpful. So, I would say the big thing is calorie restriction. And this might be a little controversial because I'm again, I'm sure there are some people that really promote this, but I find calorie restriction does not work at all for most people for several reasons. Number one, it's not that sustainable. You know, you can put yourself in a mindset of, okay, I'm going to do this for a week or two weeks or a month or something. You have a goal coming up. You want to fit into a dress for a wedding. You know, you, you can maybe do it for short periods of time, but you cannot live your entire life on a calorie restriction. And I have seen this time and time again, when Patients will come in writing down everything they're eating. Stay, they've seen a nutritionist. They're staying under a certain amount of calories, and they should be losing weight theoretically, but they're not. Um, you know, they say, "I put this into my calculator. I put the weight in. I put how many calories I'm eating. I should be losing two pounds a week, and it's not moving." And that's because the body is not as simple as. 10 calories in, 10 calories out. That's not how our bodies work. They're much more complex. Your whole process of metabolism, digestion, we talked about it before, that it depends on a lot of things. It depends on your body composition. It depends on stress levels. It depends on sleep. Everything goes into your metabolism. So if you think about it as just calories in, calories out, it's not going to work. Um, a lot of patients nowadays, unfortunately, have insulin resistance, which is basically the first step to developing prediabetes and then diabetes. And when you have insulin resistance, a, a, a calorie restricted diet 100% will not work. And I'll explain why. So when somebody eats carbohydrates, your body needs to increase insulin levels in order to take that carb and pull it into cells to use as energy. But when you have insulin resistance and you eat that carb, you need to produce super, super high levels of insulin to do the same thing. So for you to metabolize it, you need a super high number for your insulin rather than you know a low normal number. And the problem with that is that insulin is a hormone that promotes fat storage. So let's say for instance, you start your day with one piece of toast. You eat that food, your insulin level goes through the roof because it's a carb, and your body has been given the signal to store fat all day. So even though you go to do a workout, even though you have a salad for lunch, even though you have a very small dinner, your body has already been given the signal to store everything that you eat as fat. It will be close to impossible to lose weight that way. Insulin has to be low in order for fat breakdown to start happening. So if you start your day with a high carb meal, you have set yourself up for unfortunately a day of fat storage rather than fat burning. Okay. I think that's a a good point because 
especially if people want to lose weight, slim down, their goal is break down fat. But what you just said is, well, actually, it, it sounds to me like a better step might be to work on hormone balancing or insulin sensitivity, because then these things are going to be processed in a more normalized way. Whereas if, if say a person's insulin resistance and, and they need that much more insulin to process the carbs or the blood sugar, the sugar in their blood, then it's, you know, it's kind of got to do all this extra effort. Uh, is that, is that on point? Absolutely. Or no? Yeah. Working on your insulin sensitivity is probably the best thing you can do for your metabolism. Okay. And can, can you walk us through how someone could do that? Sure. So, um, there are a few natural things you can do to create insulin sensitivity or improve your insulin sensitivity. Um, there are some medications that can help as well. So naturally muscle is the king here. More muscle mass is what you need to, to work on because muscle improves insulin sensitivity. So again, going back to exercising, the more you work on strength training, resistance training, the more you focus on building up muscle, the more insulin sensitive your body will become. So that's just something I always tell my patients, like no excuses every day, do something, even if it's only for 10 minutes, even if it's only some push-ups or some sit-ups in the morning before you go to work, just do something. Because when you start activating those muscle groups, the whole day, you are going to be in a position to be more sensitive to insulin and therefore on the road to fat breakdown. So muscle is absolutely key in terms of exercise. Um, number two also kind of talking about exercise. Walking after a meal is another trick to really optimize kind of what you just ate and how your hormones are working after that meal. So if you were to eat a meal and just sit on the couch, you your body's going to have a hard time processing all of that glucose or, or carbs that you ate. And it's going to start making you feel very tired more tired than you were before potentially, and then it's going to start um, storing everything as fat. However, if you eat that meal, whatever it is, and you get up and you take even a two to five minute walk, that short of a period of time has been shown in studies to help improve blood sugar. A two to five minute walk after your meal can significantly improve blood sugar and insulin sensitivity. So walking after meals, I tell people if it's raining, if it's dark, if it's cold, walk up and down some stairs in your house, you know, walk around your office after lunch. Just don't eat a meal and sit down. You should be active afterwards. In terms of diet, drinking a lot of water can also help naturally lower blood sugar and improve insulin sensitivity. And sticking with a relatively low carb diet. You don't have to go very, very extreme. Um, some patients ask like, well, how many carbs can I eat in a day? And to be honest, I don't really like to go based on certain numbers because everybody's body is different. But you should be thinking about your meals as mixed amounts of food. You should not be sitting down to an all carb meal. You should be sitting down to maybe a little bit of carbs on that meal, but some fat, some protein, some vegetables, a good mix of everything. And by incorporating all those different types of macros, that is also going to help keep blood sugar stable and improve insulin sensitivity. Okay, right. Yeah, so going back to a few minutes ago, you'd mentioned the toast and that spiking um, the blood sugar. But if someone has that with fat, protein, butter, eggs, uh, does that balance things out a lot more? So much better. Um, yeah. You know, I would maybe argue if you're a person with significant insulin resistance or you already have diabetes, I would say try to cut the toast out in general. But for the general population who may be just struggling with some weight loss issues or a little bit of mild insulin resistance, the toast is okay as long as you add those other components. You should be eating carbs with some healthy fat, with some protein. So if, for instance, avocado, avocado toast is probably the best way to start your day in that situation. You're putting a high amount of fat on that bread. It is going to help keep your blood sugar stable for hours. It's going to help reduce the bad blood sugar spikes we see with the bread or the toast. It's going to keep your insulin a lot lower than if you had just had the piece of bread. And what's that mechanism? I mean, I can understand if we just eat a pure 
carb, that that's going to have glucose and blood sugar go up. How does, what's the mechanism that having fat with it will stabilize or change that effect? Yeah. So, um, fat and protein both slow the release of glucose into the bloodstream and that slows the release or the spike of insulin that we see. So like, coating your carbs even in a protein or a fat. For instance, rather than just eating an apple, which although very healthy, it's fruit, there's some good fiber in it, everything, you'd probably be better off putting some natural peanut butter on that apple because you are now showing your body we're not just having carbs, we're not just spiking the sugar, that protein is going to slow the release of glucose and therefore slow the insulin spike or prevent it. Okay. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is the muscle building. I've never fully followed that. I mean, I get, I can get it if researchers and studies come out that say, you know, muscle, muscle helps with glucose regulation, but I, I'm glad you added the walking piece too. Cause I don't, I don't know why my, my mind will always go to, well, what about the old Italian man who doesn't do any weight training, but he's 90, 95 and full of life. But I envision that that guy taking a, a stroll, you know, outside through whatever the beautiful Italian countryside after a meal. Or I think about my grandmother who also zero lifting weights and was a pretty um, s- small frame, smaller woman, but she did walk, you know, every morning, I'm sure uh, after dinner sometimes and, you know, stayed active like around the house gardening, um, but, you know, zero muscle training. And then I look at those two examples as I'm like, I hope I can age like that. I don't, I don't know their, you know, blood sugar numbers or anything, but look to me like they're aging, aging quite well. So why is, why is muscle so important? Or if, if we just do that simple movement, like a walking, uh, will that help people get there? So my honest opinion is nowadays in our current environment, in our current life of what is available at a grocery store, foods that we're eating, potential toxins that we're ingesting all the time, I don't feel walking is enough anymore. Back in the, let's call them the olden days, um, when food was much more natural, when we did not have as many chemicals, when um, you didn't have... 50 different options for laundry detergent or dishwasher soap and things like that. Our bodies were not exposed to these kind of chemicals that are changing our insulin sensitivity, that are um, changing how, uh, changing our risk for type 2 diabetes. So back then, I think a walk would be great and just doing normal housework would be enough to keep the metabolism going. But nowadays that we are fighting this uphill battle of chemicals in food and toxins in our environment, I think you need to add the strength training in order to combat those negative things. Okay. So strength training is just, you know, step, step above. Yeah. And can we cover a little bit the, the mechanism there of someone saying, why should I lift some weights or do a little more physical exertion? How does that connect to my, my insulin, my blood sugar and, and my overall health? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's it's been shown that muscle mass improves insulin sensitivity. So the idea is that the more you are building up your muscle groups, the more insulin sensitive you'll be. Also, as we age, again, that that number of about 40 years old or so, maybe in men closer to 50, but as you get to that age, your body starts to dramatically lose muscle mass. So as we get older, the composition of our body changes. It's not the same our entire life. So as you get older, you are disproportionately losing a bunch of muscle mass. So if you don't actively try to build that back, you're going to wind up gaining weight and having a slow metabolism. Okay. And it, it makes sense, the the picture you're painting of like the modern world and especially, I mean, like you said, it really takes some concerted effort and just building a new habit if someone's going to eat all natural foods, single ingredients from the earth, not processed. So it makes sense to me in saying in the modern world, assuming people are going to eat out and eat processed foods, even if just periodically, that there's a a higher, higher bar to meet to age well. I get that. My mind then goes, okay, but what if someone ate, um, yeah, really, really clean, really whole foods, you know, liked cooking, prepared their foods at home. It sounds like that still might not be enough. Can you also connect how, say, these chemicals, how that is then translating to insulin resistance or or other 
metabolic health issues? Yeah. So there's there are a few uh, reasons why this could maybe not go according to plan. You know, maybe you are a person that eats super healthy. You're doing everything that I'm saying. You eat natural foods. You exercise. You build up your muscle. Everything. But again, there are other factors at play. So um, genetics plays into it. So for instance, type 2 diabetes is a very genetic condition. We generally tell patients if you have a primary family member with it, meaning a parent, a sibling, um, you have over a 90% chance of getting it. Um, However, if you add on some other environmental factors that are sometimes out of our control, the risk goes up even more. And nowadays, we're actually seeing people with no genetic link to type 2 diabetes. They're the first one in their family to get it, and they're getting it very early. And this has to do with the idea of what's called epigenetics. Epigenetics is basically changes in our chromosomes that are due to environmental factors. And that could be diet, that could be chemicals, anywhere in the water, in the products that we're using, um, stress, things like that. And it literally changes the chromosome structure. And so studies have looked at tissue in patients with type 2 diabetes and have found these epigenetic changes. And there's a lot of research going into this. It's a relatively new topic. They're trying to come up with medications that target this. But the idea is, you know, you don't necessarily want to wait for all of those things to come, you know, into play. You don't want to be dependent on a medication. What's important is that you think about it proactively and you say, okay, I know the environment in some way, shape or form is causing certain medical conditions. So I need to be very cognizant over what I'm putting in my body. And that's why I really advise people to eat as natural as possible, because maybe they're eating a new product that has a certain ingredient that hasn't been associated with anything bad yet. But 20 years from now, they'll come out with a study showing that something, you know, causes cancer. So my advice is, even if we don't know 100% what any of these chemicals do, The more chemicals you are putting into your body, the more you are at risk for some kind of disruption in hormones and metabolism in your overall health. So our environment contributes tremendously. I mean, the back in, well, right now, the about in America, about two in five Americans are obese, two in five. That's up double from what it was in 1990. So over 30 years or so, it has doubled. The rates of obesity have doubled. Um, So you have to just kind of think about like, well, how has our life changed in the last 30 years? What has become more prevalent? What are people eating? What are people drinking? All of that. So environment is really, really contributing, unfortunately, to our declining health. Yeah. I think that's an important distinction you made because I feel like genetics has been used to in some ways disempower people like oh it's it's my genetics there's nothing i can do and i i fell for that too went through that and then come to find out started doing some of the things you're talking about and got big turnarounds in my health so i feel like i'm all, always passionate about making the point well you know is it is it genetics or or by that do we mean yeah you might have a higher propensity a higher possibility of expressing poor health in say diabetes and, but someone else might express it in a different way, but that doesn't mean, you know, it's an unchangeable genetic code that you're stuck with. Like you said, there's epigenetics is a big, big factor and that gives people power back to start to look at these things, their environment, et cetera. Absolutely. I tell a lot of my patients, you know, if you have this family history, you are probably at some point going to develop diabetes, but are you going to develop it when you're 90 years old? Or are you going to develop it when you're 35? You know, that idea of when things start to change and what happens to your body, that is in their control, you know, to a certain extent. <laughs> we, can't, we can't move from the planet Earth, but <laughs> other, <laughs> other, than, other than the environmental factors, I mean, that's under their control. So yes, they can take all of these um, uh, tips and changes that they should be making to their health to try to prolong the development of diabetes as long as possible. And maybe at some point they never even develop it, but they can certainly push it off if they do the right things. Right. And so at that point, I'm like, you know, people hear genetics and they just feel, oh, I'm stuck with it. It's passed down. But to me, that's more of you're likely to get it if you live the same way in the same environment that you're, you know, parents and ancestors did. No, definitely. I think um, it's almost, 
I wouldn't say it's a good thing, but it's, it's a way to kind of see, okay, this is my future if I don't change things. A lot of times the problem is when my patients come in and they say, you know, what do you mean I have diabetes? No one in my family has this. And it's so it's almost like the people who have a family history of it almost know to look out for things. They know to start making changes. They're a little bit more proactive in preventing it versus people who don't even have it in the family. They almost think like, oh, well, this can't happen to me, so I don't have to worry as much. But really, in this day and age, everybody needs to be thinking about this. Is there anything else that people come into your office with and just have a misconception or a myth about what they should be doing? You mentioned calorie restriction. Are there any other common common ideas people get that are, don't actually work? I mean, most recently, I think the, the biggest thing over the last couple of years has been um, protein shakes and protein powders. Um, Many people feel that when they start their day with that item, they are doing something healthy. And, you know, my opinion for a lot of those people is that they are doing the absolute opposite of that. So when I meet with patients, we generally go through a very thorough breakdown of exactly what they're eating. And I want to know products. I want to know flavors. I want to know everything. And anytime I look into these products that they're having, uh, I mean, the ingredient list is just terrible. And most patients don't even realize because they looked at the front, the front said something like gluten-free, dairy-free, something, something free. And they are associating that with being a healthy product. But if you turn it around and you look at that ingredient list, you realize, wow, this is loaded with artificial sweeteners. This is, it's a protein powder made from rice. I mean, to extract protein from rice is such a process. It is, they add so many chemicals, so much heat, proteins are denatured. It is not a natural thing to get protein out of rice. So people are having all of these, you know, protein bars made with rice protein. But if you really think about it, Rice is a grain. Rice has almost no nutrition in it. You should not be eating this overly processed food that is maybe derived from from something else that doesn't have any protein content. So nowadays, the biggest thing I'm dealing with, the biggest misconception is these healthy products or healthy supplements, which are actually doing the absolute opposite of what they're advertising. Yeah, yeah. It's so so tempting, you know, I've been there. But, and so again, it's the, the ideal way, hey, get, get the protein from whole food, get some balanced meals each day and then you don't need all that. Exactly. So eat, you know, eat your eggs, eat your meat. If you eat meat, um, I generally tell people, you know, if they like milk, drink milk, drink whole milk. Um, you know, if it, if they sold it in most places, I would tell people to drink raw milk because the process of pasteurizing milk actually denatures a lot of proteins and can make it very pro-inflammatory. Um, so again, just as, as natural to the earth as possible, I, you know, the, quality of protein is so much more important than the quantity. So a lot of people are on this kick of, I need 50 grams of protein a day. I need 30 grams of protein for breakfast. I need a hundred grams all day because I'm muscle building. But the quality is so much more important. You're, you're not getting the same type of protein from a scoop of pea protein powder that you are from a piece of meat. So I think too much is going into these numbers and hitting these like check boxes on your macros. It needs to be more like, let's get back to the basics. You know, the like certain vegetables will have some protein, beans will have some protein, um, dairy, that kind of stuff. Those are really the sources that our body can process a little bit more and you're going to get better quality in those foods. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I, and the more I've gotten into health and, and my own journey, it's it's like... At first, it seems so hard. You're like, oh, I got to do all this stuff. But over time, I realized like we just made up all of these right. weird ways of living in the modern world. And if we just stop doing a lot of that, then I don't have all these problems to solve. Right. And it's like, you know, came, came like always, like the, the best answer always gets more simple and elegant. But at, at first, it seems overwhelming. But just because we there's a lot to undo. Uh, and that Absolutely. was a big turning point for me, realizing I could undo stuff instead of I have to do 10 new things to my already packed, busy life. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not like back in caveman days, you had people calculating their protein for the day. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> they either like, yeah. they either killed an animal and ate it or they didn't that day. You know, it, it wasn't as complex and people were probably much healthier back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one thing we haven't covered yet, but I find is also uh, 
a, a big issue for sure with aging, but also, you know, even in younger people are hormone imbalances. And are these related? Are these downstream effects of the insulin res- resistance and the things we've been talking about? Or is it a separate track, maybe parallel, but separate? Because I find hormones like a classic example of some of the the overarching themes we've talked about. Like you can measure it in blood, you can manipulate it through different you know, supplementation or injections. But again, it's kind of a, it's a downstream process. It's like you didn't just wake up one day and the hormones were off. So yeah, we can do strong interventions to make numbers look better. Maybe in some cases really change how people feel, but that doesn't do anything to address the, the start of the cause. And if you multiply that over 10, 20 years, I don't think we know all all the effects and you know just logically it's like well if something caused an imbalance and we don't ever address that then and we let it go for another 10 or 20 years what's going to happen um down the road so is that is it all related to what we've been talking about or is there do you, um, a different track you know for most people i will say there are you know rare cases of hormonal problems that have nothing to do with health or lifestyle or anything but when you're talking more about the general population Hormone production is so intertwined with weight and insulin resistance and all of that. So for instance, fat cells produce hormones. They produce the sex hormones called estrogen and testosterone. So when you are very overweight or obese, you have an inappropriate amount of these hormones being produced And they're generally produced in ratios that we don't love. So for instance, a lot of overweight or obese women will be producing too much testosterone, which can lead to problems with their menstrual cycles becoming irregular, excessive acne, excessive hair growth, and ultimately leading to things like fertility or at least issues with ovulation. We also see in these patients with these hormonal imbalances due to obesity, we see a lot of metabolic disruption. These patients have high cholesterol, these patients have insulin resistance, or maybe even diabetes already, and they're all intertwined. Interestingly, um, in women who are overweight and have some insulin resistance and are producing these hormones, making their menstrual cycles irregular, making it difficult for them to get pregnant, we can use a medication called metformin, which is basically thought to improve insulin sensitivity. We can give these women metformin and it not only helps regulate their menstrual cycle, but it actually improves egg quality, ovulation, and pregnancy rates. So we're using the medicine to target insulin sensitivity, but it is making all of the cells in the body just work a little bit better. And so now we're seeing regular periods, um, ovulation, good egg quality and higher pregnancy rates and reduced rate of miscarriage. So these, you know, it's not just a theory that these medical problems are, are connected. We really have evidence to show that targeting one thing can really have a downstream effect on the entire body. Yeah. So if someone hears that, it's like, oh, wow, metformin is amazing all these things things can happen if that's happening because it's improving insulin sensitivity can they all is will anything that they do to improve insulin sensitivity say you know less processed foods the exercise we've been talking about is that also going to have similar benefits that you mentioned like Absolutely. hormone balancing better pregnancies etc yeah so in this in the same group of women who are overweight who are having infertility losing weight is actually the main way to improve hormone balance and get them ovulating and get their menstrual cycles regular. So losing weight is going to have the same benefit as a medicine like metformin. It's just hard for people to lose weight. So that's why sometimes we have to add the medications. But weight loss will do everything I just talked about. Weight loss will reduce fat cells. Weight loss will normalize the hormones. Weight loss will get the periods regular, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. I can see how people get turned around because I know, I feel like a lot of people who are struggling with the weight loss, then they they get told their hormones are all, all out of whack and their mind kind of is like, oh, I got to get these hormones right so I can have the weight loss. But it sounds like it's actually a reverse reverse progression. And again, we I really feel in general, we don't do enough to zero in on like, what's the core? What's the start of these imbalances in the body that yes, down the line, they lead to symptoms and diagnoses, but there's five steps before it and and we don't do a lot to educate or like i said sometimes we have to get into enough pain to to be like okay i gotta gotta really look at this 
I know you said as far as really counting calories or macros or tracking too detailed, that can can go overboard. And I've totally been in that boat too. But is there any any uh, mid place or or a different way of tracking that can help people? Um, get a handle on these things, whether it's tracking blood sugar, wh- whether it is tracking food for a period of time, it's just so as their metabolism is changing. Yeah, I guess that's more of the question. As metabolism changes, is there anything to track that helps in addition to following these health principles? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we kind of talked about as as society progressed, maybe our food is becoming more toxic. But on the other end, as our society progressed, we're developing new modalities to measure what's going on with our body. We can get more immediate feedback as to, you know, was that meal a good meal for my body or was it a bad meal? So there are a few devices on the market that can help with um, you know, self-monitoring in a sense. So one one big area is um, the world of continuous glucose monitors. So continuous glucose monitors are those devices you might see people wearing on the back of their arm. These are devices that monitor blood sugar 24-7, and it kind of sends everything to an app on your phone. And the way that I find they can be very useful in people, even without diabetes, is that you will be able to see what kind of lifestyle modifications will improve your blood sugar. For instance, you might sit down and have breakfast and notice that, okay, if you have that piece of toast, your blood sugar goes crazy high afterwards and then it plummets. And that's probably why you feel so terrible by 10 a.m. But if you put some butter on that toast, if you put that avocado on that toast, if you ate an egg with that toast, you will literally see within minutes that your blood sugar is not skyrocketing up. It's a more slow release and a slow downtrend, and it keeps your blood sugar more stable. Um, On the flip side, people will notice that certain amount, certain types of exercises help them. For instance, we talked about walking. Even my patients with diabetes, I'll tell them if they're running into a high blood sugar, go for a walk because that will within minutes start to bring down the blood sugar. And that's just very, a very powerful visual tool for people to really see that these things that we keep telling them to do, oh, wait a minute, this is actually working. This is not just like something like my doctor's telling me to eat healthy and exercise. Oh no, actually in the moment, I can see that this is having a benefit. And they can also see what types of foods are not great for their body. We generally tell people who have blood sugar problems that, for instance, rice will definitely lead to a blood sugar spike, but everybody's body is different. And so for some people, they can handle rice, but they can't handle pasta, for instance. So the device allows you to get a very personalized look into the types of foods that are best for you and the types of exercise that are best for you. They also really... um, really show us how much stress can affect blood sugar. Um, I, I have a patient who she would watch on her blood sugar machine that as soon as she got a stressful work phone call, her blood sugar would go through the roof. And, you know, we could, for a long time, we couldn't figure out why she was having high blood sugars because she was eating so well, she was exercising. But it, it was these stressful phone calls during the day that were raising her blood sugar so much. And so knowing what kind of external factors are negatively affecting your health and, and seeing that in the moment is extremely powerful. Um, for patients who are like, the, you know, they're not as worried about blood sugar. Maybe they're a little bit more interested in how their metabolism is working. I often recommend this device called a Lumen. So a Lumen is this device that you blow into. This is a device you have at home. You blow into it either every morning or you can also do different times of the day, like, you know, 30 minutes after a meal, um, just after exercise, before you go to bed, things like that. And it basically is almost measuring your metabolism in a sense and telling you if you are in a state of burning carbohydrates or burning fat. And the important thing about this is that our bodies should be able to switch between those two zones. You should be able to switch between carb burning and fat burning. And the ability to do that means that your metabolism is really excellent. It's, it's functioning very well. Um, but it can take time to get there. Oftentimes when people start this device, they will see that they're actually more in a state of carb burn at all times. They're not burning any fat. They're not losing weight. And so ways that we can improve um, that idea, it's actually referred to as metabolic flexibility, ways that we can improve it are with 
diet and exercise. So it's been found that fasting for prolonged periods can help shift our bodies into more of the fat burn stage. Not necessarily doing it every day, but at certain times of the week, going into a little bit more of a prolonged fast can improve your metabolic flexibility. Um, Also making sure you are not overeating. I mean, the main thing that affects metabolic flexibility is literally you you are taking in too much food not necessarily too many calories. I don't want to talk in terms of calories, but too much food. You're, you're, um, we call it overnutrition basically. So if you are overeating, that is also going to worsen your metabolic flexibility. Um, things to improve it though, exercise for sure. Even a balance of a little bit of some high intensity, low intensity, just getting your body to do both, you know, doing a little bit of cardio, doing a little bit of strength training, allowing your body to experience both kinds of exercise that can also help improve your metabolic flexibility. So being able to see that in real time and saying, wow, you know, I, I ate really late last night. No wonder why I woke up in a state of carb burn instead of fat burn versus, hey, I ate really clean yesterday. I took a walk after dinner. I'm feeling great. No wonder why I woke up in a state of fat burn. And just being able to see how your lifestyle changes affect your metabolism in real time is really, really helpful information. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to the the stress point you made with your patient, like that, that would be very valuable because it gets thrown out all the time. Like, lower your stress, stress is bad, but to the point where it's almost generic, you know, people have heard it so much like, yeah, it's, you know, I should manage it, but what does that mean exactly? But then to see, you know, in her example, okay, the, the work call spikes it, then she could really, you could really identify, you know, what's going on and causing these things. All right. I have, I have a few follow-up questions, everything you just said, maybe, like, maybe we could do a little bit like rapid fire or, um, okay. uh, yeah, knock off a couple of these when, when it comes to uh, taking in too much food, and you said that can affect the metabolic flexibility. Why does that happen? So when you're eating food, your body is focused on digesting that food, metabolizing it, your blood sugar goes up, your insulin goes up, eventually your blood sugar goes down. It's working hard on processing the food you just ate. But what your body is not doing is working on all of your stored fat and your stored energy reserves. So the idea is that you don't want to be constantly feeding your body and be in a state of trying to digest that food. You also want to be in a state of making sure that we're working off some of our fat storage areas. Okay. So you get this nice progression where you ingest, you eat food that brings a lot of energy and macronutrients in, but then as that gets processed and fully used up, then, then the body can flip into using what's stored. And is it, do you just kind of want that like nice wave up and down progression, uh, uh, you know, a few times per day on average? Yeah. You want, you want to be in those two states, at least like, you know, a state of fat burning, a state of carb burning at least once a day that you've gone back and forth. And that just really shows that your body is able to not only metabolize what you ate, but again, use your storage. Because when you are eating those foods, you are then storing them. So if you're constantly just storing food and you're never using those stores, that's what leads to weight gain long term. When you say fat burning, is that ketosis or not necessarily? No, not ketosis. So fat burning, it's generally this process called lipolysis, which is just the breakdown of fat. Ketosis is really a different state. That is when you're, you know, very extreme low carb diet um, and you are really only utilizing fat for energy. Um, but the idea of lipolysis and just utilizing your fat stores and being able to switch back and forth is is almost a healthier state to be in. Right. Okay. Got it. And if someone is doing that low carb di- diet, because I've done this so many times, I think it's human nature too, to just overcorrect. So you learn about something and and that's what I think, especially in nutrition, we've demonized so many things. It's like, well, no, not really. Just the extremes, like way too much or way too little is actually the issue. Mm-hmm. But say someone's on a, a lower carb diet, we've talked about high blood sugar a lot, but can they... Um, drop into like a hypoglycemic state or, or low blood sugar, even after um, meals, if they're, if they're really restricting the carbs? So unless they're on medication such as insulin or other medicines that can cause low, low blood sugars, it's very uncommon to have a low blood sugar just normally. Um, 
in in cases of people who are malnourished, who maybe don't have any of those fat stores, you know, they're very underweight. Those are people where potentially if they're not getting in enough nutrients, they could drop their blood sugar too low. But in most people that that will absolutely not happen. I have had a lot of patients come in at times saying, I feel like I'm getting hypoglycemic, meaning a low blood sugar. Or, you know, after I eat an hour later, I feel very shaky. I got to have a piece of candy. It's not that their sugar is dropping too low. It's that their sugar is dropping too fast and they feel that. And that generally happens when people are having a lot of sugar, a lot of starches where they get that spike in blood sugar and then the crash and they're feeling that crash. And that's not something that should be like brushed under the rug of like, oh, well, let me just have something else to bring it up. It should be, wow, I need to change how I'm eating because my body does not like when I have those carb only or or sugar only meals. I really need to have a good amount of fat or a good amount of protein with that carb in order to keep things steady. Our bodies are very smart. If something is not going right, you're going to have symptoms. You're going to feel it. So listening to that and knowing that something feels wrong is very important. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to measuring the blood sugar, what is what do normal fluctuations look like versus when does it get into concerning territory? So a normal blood sugar in someone without diabetes or or anything like that, a normal blood sugar would probably be as low as 60 to 65. And even like an hour or two hours after a meal, as high as 120. If you are seeing numbers over 120 and it's been more than two hours since you ate something, that's a little concerning. Um, if you haven't eaten anything, if you're fasting, if you just woke up in the morning, you haven't eaten for six, eight, 10 hours, and your blood sugar is over 100, that's definitely concerning as well. So a fasting blood sugar normal should really be between, let's say, 60 to 95. And two hours after a meal should be somewhere less than 120. So if you're seeing numbers higher than that, that might be a red flag that something's going on. All right. Well, thank you for coming on today. It's been great to hear you share and really refreshing to hear someone that's you know a doctor working in the you know, conventional medical space and bringing in all these other, other aspects that just empower people and, you know, give them different ways to, you know, age gracefully and and healthfully. So if people want to follow more of your work, how can they do that? Yeah. So I'm, um, you can follow me on Instagram. Um, my handle is endo health doc. Um, I also see patients in practice in Montclair, New Jersey, if anybody is in the area, um, and you can find me there. Okay, great. We will link to uh, your Instagram and if, if you got a website or anything for uh, private practice, we'll link to that too. Great. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. This was great.